One, two, three. Yeah. Who's everyone's favorite ladies' man? Well, it's definitely not Johnny Bravo, but hey, let's just pretend that he is. Johnny Bravo aired from 1997 to 2004 and was initially produced by Hanna-Barbera for its first three seasons, then by Cartoon Network for the fourth and final season. The show centers around the dense and self-centered Johnny Bravo, whose overwhelmingly narcissistic behavior repels the women that he tries so desperately to romance. I just want to be happy. Based loosely off of an Elvis impersonator, Johnny harpers a distinct speech pattern, characterized by his overuse of the phrase, Oh Mama. His ignorant nature causes him to fall into bizarre situations that are nothing short of entertaining. Johnny's adventures are often accompanied by little Susie, his young next door neighbor, Bunny Bravo, his mother, Carl, his best friend, though Johnny doesn't know that, or Pops, Carl's dad and owner of the local diner. Before we get started, make sure to hit that subscribe button to stay up to date on all the crazy cartoon adventures that we explore. Now, without further ado, let's visit Aaron City, home of the world-famous Johnny Bravo. In the first episode, titled Johnny Bravo, we meet our womanizing protagonist, Johnny Bravo, spending the day at the Aaron City Zoo, where he's trying his best to pick up some chicks. I hope you don't take this the wrong way or anything, but there's just too big of a generation gap between the two of us. However, it seems like the ladies at the zoo are less than interested, as his forward way of flirting causes him to get tased by a lady passing by. Suddenly, a woman frantically runs past him, and he chases after her. Really? Enough about you, let's talk about me. Johnny Bravo. He realizes that she works at the zoo, and she reveals that their prized gorilla has gone missing. In an effort to win her affection, Johnny Bravo vows to find the gorilla and bring him back. Missy, you're looking at the only man to have ever earned his black belt. He searches the city for any leads and runs into a big man who looks suspiciously like a gorilla. Johnny asks if the man has seen a giant ugly gorilla recently, and the man explains that he saw one earlier that was traveling in the opposite direction, sending Johnny Bravo off to continue his search. He asks everyone he can find if they've seen any gorillas, but they all deny any sightings. You wouldn't happen to be hiding any gorillas underneath them clothes, would you? <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, the gorilla runs into a man who attempts to mug him. The gorilla easily overpowers the robber and beats him up while calling him giant and ugly. Johnny overhears this and comes racing over and restrains the burglar, convinced that he is the missing gorilla since he matches his description of the wild animal. The zookeeper finds them and requests her gorilla back. When Johnny offers up the burglar, she walks past him and grabs the real gorilla. As she walks away, Johnny asks if he'll be rewarded for his search with a kiss or a date, and the zookeeper responds that it looks like he's already found a date since he was still holding the robber in his arms. This is cute and all, but I have a wife. <laughs> In Johnny Bravo and the Amazon Women, Johnny Bravo attempts to pull some smooth moves on a woman while on a whale-watching cruise. Instead of wooing her, he gets pepper sprayed and falls into the ocean. You smell kind of pretty. Wanna smell me? A whale tosses him up in the air and smacks him with his tail, sending him flying. He lands on a mysterious island where he overhears a woman's voice singing. He searches for her and finds a giant woman. He tries to romance her, but she's unamused. You wanna see my chest hair? It's blonde and curly. She expresses her disdain for him being on her island and summons Christopher, a giant purple elephant. She orders him to not let Johnny Bravo follow her back to the village of beautiful women. Village of Beautiful Women. She leaves, and Johnny interrogates Christopher about the village while the elephant attempts to play dumb. Johnny attempts to follow the giant lady, but Christopher stops him, ripping off Johnny's underwear in the process. Don't hate me because I am beautiful. Oh, wait a minute, what are you doing? And he begins to taunt him and beat him up. Johnny pretends to see Don Knotts to distract Christopher. And when the elephant's back is turned, Johnny runs off and finds the village. Hubba hubba. However, when the women spot him in the village, they summon Christopher again. They discuss what to do with him, and decide he must be a virgin sacrifice to please Athena. Did she say virgin? They bring him to a volcano and force him to jump in. And as the volcano begins to shake angrily and erupt, Johnny is sent flying through the air. He lands on the island of beautiful men, where he is welcomed, much to his dismay. Uh, cheer up, Johnny. At least you have your good looks going for you. 
We were all about to take a swim. I've got an extra swimsuit if you'd care to join us. Next is Super Duke. As Johnny passes by a school on his way to the grocery store, he runs into little Susie, who invites him to come to her class and meet her teacher. After seeing the attractive teacher, Johnny happily accepts, and Susie explains that he'll be her project for show and tell. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the world's greatest superhero. When she presents him to the class, she lies and says he's a superhero named Bravo Man. When Johnny tries to explain the situation, the kids don't believe him, and the teacher mentions that she has a thing for superheroes, so naturally, he leans into it. Wanna see me comb my hair really fast? <laughs> Suddenly, the bank across the street gets robbed, and the class brings over Bravo Man to save the day. Upon hearing a superhero is there, all the cops leave everything up to Johnny. Hey, let's go get some donuts! Yeah! This'll surely end well. Little Susie does some investigating and finds out that Sweet Cheeks, a candy-powered villain, is responsible for the robbery. I just love a man who stands up to supervillains. Stand back, everybody! As Sweet Cheeks comes running out of the bank, Johnny attempts to stop him, but the villain slams into him and continues running off. Despite his very obvious loss, the children still admire Bravo Man, gawking at his unconventional tactics for stopping villains. Susie tells Johnny that he doesn't have to pretend to be a superhero anymore. When the teacher mentions how brave Johnny is, he assures Susie he'll get her an A+. I already got an A on my project. That was very brave. He continues pursuing Sweet Cheeks, but is always outmatched by the villain. But Bravo Man totally escaped! Oh! After Johnny is pushed into a manhole, Susie tries to get Sweet Cheeks to back into it, giving Johnny the perfect opportunity to capture him. However, a rat crawls up Johnny's pants and bites him, and he shoots up through the air, yelping in pain. He lands harshly on the ground, covering himself with mud. Afterwards, Sweet Cheeks takes little Susie and threatens to turn her into a chocolate bunny. Not good. The kids run to Johnny to get him to help, but he's too focused on trying to get a hose to work to rinse himself off. The hose suddenly begins spraying a powerful stream of water, causing Johnny to lose control and begins spraying Sweet Cheeks. Are you okay? I sure am, thanks to Bravo Man. Upon getting wet, the villain begins to melt, and Johnny saves the day. In all of his glory, Johnny returns to the teacher and tries to sweep her off of her feet. She states that she already has a boyfriend, but Johnny coyly replies that he bets that he's no Bravo Man. Suddenly, a superhero named Pretty Boy lands in front of them, takes the teacher in his arms, and flies away. I guess she really did have a thing for superheroes. Use your heat vision! Use your heat vision! On which one? In the sensitive mail, Johnny spots a lady at the park and uses his macho body to try and impress her. Oh, pressure. The lady unenthusiastically rejects him and walks away. She runs into a short, older-looking man who approaches her with flowers and explains through his bashfulness that he finds her very beautiful and asks her on a date. Flattered, the lady accepts his invitation and gives him her phone number. Shocked at this exchange, Johnny approaches the man and begs him to reveal his secrets on how to get a lady. The man explains that women dig a man with depth and goes on to sing a thoughtful tune about sensitivity in an effort to educate Johnny on a new approach. Sensitivity, sensitivity, show that girl you really give a deep. The man decides to take Johnny under his wing to teach him more lessons on romance. But look here, Johnny. Hey, cool. How do you know my name? Hey, that doesn't matter. All that matters is... They find a woman on the street with a dog and a stroller. The man preps Johnny for conversation, explaining that being observant can help him approach the lady, and advises him to begin the interaction by acknowledging her dog. All I had to do was notice she had a dog. Observation! Johnny confidently begins his attempt of winning the lady over, but he accidentally knocks the stroller away, and the dog begins flying down the street. He runs after it, but fails to grab it before it flies off a bridge. Luckily, Johnny's mentor was standing on the rocks below and managed to catch the pooch. They return the dog to the woman, who expresses her sincere thanks to the man and gives him a kiss.
Later at a restaurant, Johnny spots another beautiful lady and explains his plan to flex his pecs at her to win her over. The man explains that women appreciate men who are in touch with their feminine side and aren't too masculine. So Johnny approaches the lady while wearing a frilly dress and lipstick. However, instead of getting the girl, she laughs in his face and walks away. And he instead attracts two sailors who are enamored by his beauty. Take that, sailor boys. Man, I can't wait till next shore leave. At a fountain, Johnny yet again finds a woman that catches his eye. The man asks Johnny what he's planning to do, and Johnny informs him that he's going to ask the hot mama to go back to his place to play Twister. How sophisticated. Thankfully, the man teaches Johnny that women don't want to be degraded with names like hot mama, but respected. The man assures Johnny that manners will take him far, and sends him on his way to try out his new respectful flirting. Pardon me, hot sexy mama. Johnny unsuccessfully attempts his new approach, and the woman uses the fountain to wish for a herd of buffalo to trample him. Later that night, Johnny gives up and informs the man that his sweet and sensitive techniques will not work on him. The man informs Johnny that he just pretends to be polite, thoughtful, and considerate, and doesn't truly mean it. He continues rambling on, staging that he'd say anything a woman wants to hear just to get her to date him. After his long rant, all of the women throughout the day appear, as he sheepishly tries to backtrack on what he had said. They angrily tie him up and take him away, and Johnny disgustedly realizes what a jerk the man is. Oh, please. I've never seen anything quite like which is one of the only times in the entire series where I can agree with them. Things get a little spooky in Bravo Dooby Doo. After his car breaks down in a dark forest, Johnny Bravo flags down a van that's passing by, which just so happens to be the Mystery Machine. Yup, we've got a Scooby crossover on our hands. He asks the Mystery Gang if they would be so kind as to take him to his aunt's house that he was on his way to visit. Initially, the gang doesn't seem too thrilled, but once Johnny mentions that she lives in a creepy mansion, they are more than happy to oblige. On the car ride over, Johnny attempts to impress Daphne, who does not seem to share the same romantic feelings. They arrive at his aunt's house, but find no sign of her. Scooby and Shaggy run off and open a random door while looking for food, and they come face to face with a ghoulish looking gardener. They run to alert the rest. I can't see without my glasses. My glasses. I can't be seen without my glasses. But when they return, the creepy ghost is nowhere to be found. You know, we gotta keep meeting like this. In classic Mystery Inc. fashion, the gang decides to split up to look for clues. Johnny tries to get grouped with Daphne, but ends up being paired with Shaggy. Daphne? I mean, Fred and I'll look in the basement. The two search the kitchen and surprisingly find the ghost in the pantry. They try to run and hide, but the ghost is too clever and easily finds them. This, of course, results in the iconic chase and hide montage seen in every Scooby-Doo episode. They catch up with the others and attempt to warn them, but as they run down the stairs, Johnny accidentally goes flying and gets stuck on a chandelier. The ghost continues to chase the group, wielding a weed whacker. As they run past Johnny, the chandelier falls on top of the ghost, successfully trapping it. They attempt to reveal the culprit. Bigfoot! Not. And underneath multiple masks, the ghost is revealed to be Johnny's aunt. Huh? When questioned why she would do such a thing, she admits she was trying to scare Johnny away because she doesn't like him. And I would have done it too if it hadn't been for you meddling kids. The gang apologizes for ruining her plans and asks if there's anything they could do to make it up to her. And they end up returning to the forest and tying Johnny to a tree to leave him there. Hey pal, hop in. I'll give you a lift. Next up is Date with an Antelope. After discovering online blind dating, Johnny scores a date for the night. Hey, all you hot mamas. Wanna talk to a steaming hunk of cyber fella? However, when his date Carol arrives, she turns out to be an antelope. This has got to be the most egregious case of catfishing I've ever seen. That said, Johnny decides to play it cool and continue with the date. How about if I pay for dinner? Oh, wow. <laughs> Thanks, you're the best. Carol takes the wheel, and Johnny fears for his life and prays to make it through her tumultuous driving. Crazy women antelope drivers! They attend a carnival together and ride the carousel. 
It's romantic, Johnny. But Carol gets too excited and causes Johnny to go flying off the ride. He falls through the roof of a tent and into a cannon and is shot back into the air and lands harshly on the ground. They then go to a restaurant to have a nice dinner. When they arrive, the host denies them entry, stating that they only serve people at the restaurant. Carol recognizes the host and reveals that her father went to school with him. The host excitedly recognizes Carol and urgently shows them to a table, while Johnny processes his very strange night. For dinner, Johnny orders crab and Carol orders grass. Um, I'll have some grass. Uh, just a little, though. I usually just chew the same bite for hours. When their food arrives, Johnny asks Carol why she wants to date a human. Carol shyly admits that she's just trying to teach her possessive boyfriend a lesson. Relieved that the stakes are so low, Johnny accepts this answer, but asks if he should be scared of her boyfriend coming to get him. Suddenly, the crab on his plate jumps up and reveals himself to be Carol's boyfriend. Well, that was new. And he begins pinching Johnny in the face. The two have a scuffle in the middle of the restaurant, and they end up getting arrested and put in jail. Carol visits his cell and admits she feels terrible for everything that happened, and Carol's crab boyfriend, who is now Johnny's cellmate, continues to shout at him aggressively. Let this be a warning to anyone who's considering going on a blind date. You know, there's a lesson here. Four-legged chicks are nothing but trouble. In Johnny Meets Farrah Fawcett, Johnny excitedly prepares to go to the store to buy Farrah Fawcett's new shampoo. He suddenly gets a phone call from little Susie next door, inviting him to her birthday party that afternoon. Johnny rejects her invitation, but Susie insistently and continuously begs him. Johnny explains that he is busy all day because he's going to pick up the new Farrah Fawcett shampoo, and Susie excitedly reveals that Farrah is her cousin and will be attending the birthday party. Convinced that she's lying, Johnny insists that he's too big and too handsome to attend a little kid's party. She's coming to my party. Yeah, right. And pigs fly. And Susie angrily retorts that she'll be taking his name off of the guest list. Suddenly, a giant limo appears, and Farrah Fawcett emerges, greets Susie, and asks if she's set up the kissing booth yet. Johnny overhears this and begins plotting on a way to get into the party. The only person whose hair is prettier than mine. <laughs> When he tries to enter through the line, security realizes his name has been crossed off the guest list and refuses him entry. You can never be too careful. It's a bomb. Ah, oh. He returns, this time dressed as a clown, but again, fails to get inside. He steals a bunch of balloons and attempts to float down into Susie's backyard, but security spots him and blows him away with a fan, pushing his balloons into a sharp object and causing him to fall down. I can't remember the last time I was blindfolded. Wait. Yes, I can. <laughs> he looks up to find a man dressed as a giant purple dinosaur named Smarmy and proceeds to beat him up and take his costume. As he approaches, the security guard begins to gush over Smarmy and bashfully admits how big of a fan he is. Johnny tramples over him and makes it into the party. One for you, and one for you where he's surrounded by a horde of children. Farrah Fawcett goes to give Smarmy a big kiss, and Johnny fervently tries to get the costume off to no avail. Farrah kisses him, and he faints. Farrah thanks Susie for having her over for the party, and Susie apologizes for Johnny's absence. Farrah replies that she'll just have to find another date for the night. She leaves, and all of the children celebrate the rest of the party by bouncing on top of Johnny's body. Next is a wolf in chick's clothing. After scanning the personal ads in the newspaper, Johnny scores a date. Must love full moons and dogs. Call me. My name is Fluffy. When he arrives, he is approached by a beautiful woman. and He's over the moon. Just when things seem too good to be true, she transforms into a wolf right in front of him. Johnny's initial fright subsides when he learns that his attractive date will change back to normal once the sun rises. So he decides to bite the bullet and continue with his date. Yeah, I'll bet there's a beautiful little sweetie pants underneath all that hair. Johnny and the woman attempt to have a normal outing, but her abnormal appearance catches people's attention and causes chaos wherever they go. It's almost time, Johnny. Oh, liking that. Somehow, Johnny manages to make it through the night and eagerly awaits for the sunrise. Give me an S. Give me an unrise. <laughs> Hello, sunrise. <laughs> his patience pays off, and his date transforms back into the beautiful lady from the night before. Is this what you want? <laughs> oh, that's the stuff. 
She suddenly asks Johnny what day it is, and he reveals that it's Wednesday. She frantically explains that she forgot to reveal that on Wednesdays, she turns into an annoying little bald man named Malvin who collects stamps. Johnny is pushed over the edge and decides to cut his losses and run away from Malvin, who continues to chase after him. You know, you would think after one bad date with an animal creature, Johnny would learn his lesson. But I guess desperate times call for desperate measures. Up next, we have intensive care. Little Susie is in the hospital after getting her tonsils removed. So Johnny's mom, Bunny Bravo, brings Johnny to the hospital dressed as a clown to cheer Susie up. Johnny's unenthused attitude quickly shifts when he spots Susie's young and attractive nurse. Help nurse, beautiful. He tries to get her phone number, but the nurse summons the help of her Igor-esque colleague, Alphonse, who distracts Johnny by hitting him on the head with a giant mallet. Roll, roll, roll your chair. Don't you wanna play? Alphonse continues to use violent and sadistic ways to keep Johnny away from the nurse, including, but not limited to, throwing him down a staircase, smashing him with a grand piano, and using a whistle to get dogs to attack Johnny. What did you say? Nothing. You'd like to donate your liver? Through his facade of fake injuries to get the nurse's attention, Johnny ends up becoming actually hurt and is soon covered in a full body cast. Susie returns back to the hospital after being discharged with a case of the chicken measles. Hey Johnny, guess what? Now I caught the chicken measles. Pretty cool, huh? Which she so graciously gives to poor Johnny, who contemplates whether any of what he has gone through has been worth it. Spoiler alert, it wasn't. In Going Batty, Johnny tries to put up chicks on the street for a fun night out, but none seem to be interested. What are you doing this Saturday night? It is Saturday, you pinhead! Meanwhile, a vampire couple stand in the park and begin to argue. The woman admits that she's bored with their routine and expresses unhappiness in their relationship. She spots Johnny standing alone on the street and breaks up with her boyfriend so she can pursue Johnny instead. When she approaches him, Johnny obviously has no objections to taking her out on a date. I am Lois, a mistress of the night. And I am Johnny Bravo, a mister of the universe. They go to a restaurant and Johnny orders them both pasta. After he inhales his meal, the woman asks if she can kiss Johnny's neck, but she runs away screaming after she smells the garlic on his breath. Her vampire ex-boyfriend hides in the shadows of the restaurant, determined to use his powers to sabotage their date, and uses magic to get the plate of pasta on the table to strangle Johnny, who fervently attempts to break free. The woman returns to find Johnny laying on the ground, but even after that near-death experience, they decide to continue their date elsewhere. They arrive at a pier, where they find a carnival. Hey, little mama, where's your reflection? Wow, look at that mirror. Johnny tries to use his muscles to play a strength game to win his date a prize, but her ex-boyfriend yet again uses his powers to prevent Johnny from winning. After numerous attempts, he gives up, and the woman expresses her disappointment in not getting a prize. After they leave, the ex-boyfriend plays the game and easily secures a prize. Yeah, thanks, buddy. Keep the change. Excellent. A quarter. I can now retire. Johnny and the woman get drinks together, and she reveals that she is a vampire. She also admits that the only reason she's on a date with Johnny is because she wanted to make her boyfriend jealous, but disheartedly states that it doesn't seem to work. Suddenly, her boyfriend appears and begins to serenade her in front of everyone. He tearfully begs for her back and presents the prize that he won for her, and she reconciles with him. But hey, the best vampire won, right? Johnny questions if they're worried the people around them will freak out because they're vampires, and they reveal that everyone in the restaurant are actually vampires, plus a few werewolves and a gnome here and there. They all celebrate the eventful night with a conga line, which Johnny seems surprisingly okay with. I mean, hey, who could turn down a conga line? Next is Red Face in the White House. While touring the White House, Johnny accidentally ticks off every woman in his tour group with a misogynistic comment, and has to run for his life as an angry mob chases after him. Not a woman here could vote no matter what age, but the 19th Amendment struck down that restrictive rule. Why they go and do that? Meanwhile, the president's daughter angrily objects against her father and the robot boyfriend he had built for her. Um, I'm not gonna ask. 
She angrily states that she wants to date a real boy, but her father assures her that the only way for her to be safe is for her to date robots. She kicks them out of her room and begins to sob, which Johnny overhears from his hiding place. He runs into her room. Hey, pretty mama. <laughs> if these pecs don't cheer you up, nothing will. She excitedly asks him on a date, and he happily agrees. Johnny? Bonnie? They manage to sneak out of the White House, but the Secret Service realizes this and notifies the president, who tasks them with keeping an eye on her and making sure she gets home safely. I'm serving the steaks. Without checking them for poison, or knives, or foreign objects. As their date progresses, the president daughter realizes that Johnny is no match for her intelligence, and she quickly loses interest. Please tell me you know something about the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier? Well, if they don't know who he is, why don't they just open up the tomb and take a look? She summons the Secret Service guards, who did a poor job of hiding their presence, who quickly take care of Johnny. Four forms of jiu-jitsu and two forms of reggae impressionism. Yeah, well, Secret Service. She returns home to her father, who reprimands her for going behind his back. She apologizes, but admits that she would rather date robots if that's how real boys behave. The agents reveal that they have taken care of the situation, and we see Johnny stuffed in a box with other robot boyfriend prototypes somewhere deep beneath the White House's grounds. Somehow, the president's daughter being forced to have a robot boyfriend seems like the least bizarre thing that's happened in the White House. Kicking off season two is Bikini Space Planet. What a title. Johnny arrives at a diner to partake in his favorite pastime, harassing women, I mean, picking up chicks. Hey, baby, anybody ever tell you I have beautiful eyes? <laughs> While in his element, he is observed by two beautiful alien ladies who then approach him and manage to lure him away to their spaceship, where they all fly off to somewhere in the galaxy. Let me think about it. Okay, I thought about it. Well, let's motor. A nerdy boy named Carl enters the diner and greets his father, Pops, the owner. Before he can get a word out, Pops frantically grabs Carl and reveals he saw Johnny leave with the space ladies, and that he fears he may have been kidnapped. They begin to brainstorm a way to bring Johnny back and save him. This machine I'm building should help us pierce the time-space continuum and suck Johnny back to Earth. Meanwhile, Johnny and the ladies arrive on their mysterious planet where they begin to conduct a series of tests on him. I will ask you to complete the task that men were placed in the universe to perform. Open this. After passing each one, the aliens bring Johnny to their queen, who reveals that she has been observing him for quite some time and offers to make him the planet's king. In true Johnny Bravo fashion, he humbly accepts, and the alien ladies bring him to his new chambers, which contain everything a human man could ever want, including a pool table, a soda machine, and a giant TV. When Johnny goes to watch cable television, the TV doesn't work, and the ladies set off to fix it. You know, bass fishing, runway models, Runway models, cable. Meanwhile, back on Earth, Carl and Pops work fervently in their backyard, piecing together a giant contraption that will hopefully somehow bring Johnny home. I just hope it works. It's got to work, Pops. It's just got to. Johnny's cable television is finally fixed, and it powers on. A TV show depicting a macho man in a kilt appears on the screen, completely capturing all of the alien lady's attention. Johnny attempts to regain their affection, but it is too late, and he is tossed out like a giant pile of trash. He's sent back to Earth and lands in Carl's backyard, which convinces them that their giant contraption worked. Carl celebrates Johnny's return, but Johnny does not share the same sentiment as he grieves the loss of his alien kingdom. An endless bummer, Johnny arrives at the beach to spend the day doing what he does best, annoying every woman in a five-mile radius. Can't see. He attempts to bud into every activity that the women at the beach are participating in, like swimming, frisbee, and sand volleyball. How about I apply a little oil, old Johnny? Thanks, mate. Awfully sporting of you. Oh, I, I, I. But none of his advances are welcomed, and he continuously makes a fool of himself. He notices a group of women fawning over a buff, blonde lifeguard, so Johnny distracts him and takes his place. The group disperses as Johnny tries to use his new lifeguard position to impress them, to no avail. Must have gone to spread the word. Shouldn't be long now. He becomes frustrated and wonders what he's doing wrong, when suddenly a creature appears on the beach, frightening the beachgoers and causing panic. Johnny approaches it and realizes that it's just Carl covered in seaweed. 
After hearing Johnny's qualms about the lack of action he's getting even as lifeguard, Carl reveals that chicks dig it when lifeguards demonstrate their life-saving abilities. Help! Save me! Where am I gonna find someone to save? Johnny begins to brainstorm a way to save someone while completely ignoring a drowning person screaming for help. Oh, the irony. There's someone now! He runs into Pops, who gives him the idea to have someone fake drown so Johnny can save them. Uh, I gotta find someone to rescue and I ain't having much luck. Okay. He quickly snacks on the clams that Pops is selling, then races over to Carl, who he flings into the ocean. However, as soon as he steps foot into the water, Johnny succumbs to a painful cramp since he didn't wait to swim after eating, and he begins to drown. Seeing his friend in need of assistance, Carl springs into action and saves Johnny. Stand back, everyone! I'm going to give him the kiss of life! Once they make it onto the shore, Carl repeatedly gives Johnny mouth to mouth until he regains consciousness and begins to frantically cleanse himself of Carl's lip contact, while Carl enjoys a crowd of women who commend him for saving Johnny's life. <laughs> what can I say? Chicks dig nerdy guys. In Jailbird Johnny, Johnny hangs out on the sidewalk and decides to enjoy a delicious candy bar. After he's finished, he begins to walk away when all of a sudden, he's stopped by an angry police officer. The officer notices a candy bar wrapper on the ground, accuses Johnny of littering, and writes him a ticket for $10. 10 whole dollars! Johnny begins to panic and explains that he doesn't have that sort of cash, and shows the officer the measly amount of change that he has in his pockets. Believing this to be an attempt at bribery, the officer takes Johnny by the ear and brings him downtown to the courthouse. You trying to bribe me, fella? No, I'm just trying to give you stuff so you'll let me go. Where he is sentenced to 86 consecutive life sentences for his heinous crime. Do you have a lawyer? No, Your Honor, I'll be defending myself. <laughs> Bunny Bravo and Little Susie watch from the audience in dismay, and they begin to plan some way to get Johnny out of his sentence. When Johnny arrives, he notices his paperwork says, Johnny Bravo, but the prison workers insist that everything is correct. When he arrives at his cell, he realizes that all of the other inmates, including his roommates, are women. Hold the phone. This is a ladies' prison. The system does work. And that the typo in his name caused him to be placed into a women's prison. Suddenly, his hopeless demeanor changes to one similar to a kid in a candy store. Bonnie and Susie revisit the scene of Johnny's crime and attempt to reenact the situation, but it doesn't yield much help to them. <laughs> Do the monkey. Susie begins to wonder if there was an eyewitness anywhere nearby when Johnny's arrest happened. I had a guy here, I would hold his hand as we watched the sunset over the guard tower. If I had a guy here... Hey, wait a sec, I am a guy! Meanwhile, Johnny reveals that he's actually a man, and all of the women in the prison begin to swarm him, each one desperate to get a date with the only man they've had contact with in years. Johnny takes this all in, and he begins to realize that his 86 consecutive life sentences may not be so bad after all. He is suddenly summoned to the warden's office, where he's met by Bunny and Susie. <gasps> Mama! And what's her name? Susie presents new evidence from Johnny's case, a video from a nearby bank's security camera, which reveals that the trash on the sidewalk was not from Johnny's candy bar, but another person who haphazardly tossed their trash in the direction of the trash can and missed. He unwraps the candy bar. Johnny? Hey, I'm hungry. The warden determines that Johnny is not guilty and clears him of his sentences. Johnny begs to stay in the prison, insisting that he is guilty, but the warden has no time for his pleas. She dismisses him promptly. But wait, I I'm guilty. I, I robbed a cop. I, I hit on Judge Trudy. Bunny thanks little Susie for helping her free her son, and they celebrate and drag a defeated Johnny back to the car to leave. You know, if the punishment for littering was 86 consecutive life sentences, I bet we would have a much cleaner planet. Just something to think about. Next is Ape is Enough. Pops and Carl prepare to depart on their annual recipe hunt to the South Seas. Pops invites Johnny to tag along and help with the grueling manual labor, and Johnny promptly declines. If you go on that recipe hunt every year, how come all you serve is burgers and chili? When Pops mentions the possibility of running into gorgeous navy chicks, Johnny quickly changes his mind and decides to join them. As they sail the turbulent sea, Johnny accidentally crashes the boat and sends them all flying onto Skull Island. <laughs> Their initial arrival on the island is uneventful, and Pops begins to question the island's reputation for being dangerous. Suddenly, a tribe of masked people surround them and kidnap Johnny. Aw, 
Oh, who are you trying to scare with them cheesy masks? <laughs> Carl frantically insists on rescuing him, while Pop sees this as an inconvenience to his scheduled recipe tastings. They pursue the tribe and find Johnny tied to poles and surrounded by fire. Well, I guess I could stay a little longer. All of a sudden, a giant female ape comes bounding through the tribe's ritual and steals Johnny. Carl tries to stop the ape, but she quickly overpowers him and devours him in a single bite. Drat. Now we're really getting off schedule. She takes Johnny to her cave. Pops has no other option but to follow. When they arrive at her humble abode, the ape begins to hula dance for Johnny in hopes of seducing him. The ape spots Pops sneaking in and grabs him. Just as she's about to eat him, a giant two-headed rabbit enters the cave and begins attacking the ape, creating ample time for Pops and Johnny to escape. Pops notices the ape's flirtatious nature with Johnny and suggests that instead of escaping alone, they take the ape back with them to Aaron City as an attraction and offers to split the profits 95-5 with Johnny, who excitedly agrees. You can make over $50. I'm in. Carl returns and admits he'd rather not explain how he escaped the ape. Fair enough. With everyone accounted for, they return home. They display the ape proudly, and news reporters, models, and celebrities all flock to see the exotic attraction. Look, it's the ape boyfriend. Shut up. We're just good friends. Yeah, right. Johnny excitedly poses next to a group of models, and the ape becomes enraged. She breaks free from her chains and grabs Johnny, who fervently issues apologies, promising her that she's the only woman that matters to him. Johnny's mother sees this unfold on TV, and she hurriedly arrives on the scene to save her son. I'll save you from that giant ape pussy right after I finish my rep. She swoops down in a jet plane, projecting a slideshow of all her vacation pictures, which begins to lull the ape to sleep, successfully saving Johnny from her wrath. No, Mama! Not your vacation slides from Tampa! In Welcome Back, Bravo, Johnny receives a letter in the mail informing him that he never actually passed the fourth grade and consequently missed out on his learning social skills, which might explain why he acts the way he does. To unseal envelope, peel back flap, and... Give me that, Johnny! Bunny Bravo insists he return back to school, refusing to accept her son as a fourth grade dropout. Little Susie excitedly reveals that Johnny and her will be in the same class, much to Johnny's dismay. The following day, Johnny is put on the bus and shipped off to school with Susie. He enters his new classroom and immediately tries to romance the young and beautiful teacher. Good morning, class. Whoa! Learning is its own reward. Who insists she does not date her students. Susie is assigned to monitor Johnny's progress with his social skills. Good luck with that. I object! <laughs> Withdrawn. Later that day during lunch, Johnny's crude behavior causes a food fight to break out, resulting in a failing grade for cafeteria conduct. Can I have cutsies? No. Look, Leonardo DiCaprio. Where? When they return to class, Johnny does a puppet show presentation to insult the entire class, which, again, results in a failing grade and respect for others. This is my diorama of the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Boring! The class takes a field trip to the Museum of Extremely Dangerous Things, where Susie informs Johnny he must score an A triple plus in team supportiveness to pass the fourth grade, or else he'll have to start all the way over. What happens to children who sit too close to widescreen TV? Now follow me to the Hall of Nasty Paper Cuts. While exploring the museum, Johnny accidentally sets off a bomb, causing panic. Right as it's about to explode, Johnny trips and falls on top of it, effectively shielding the rest of the class from the blast. The only thing there is to do! Get out of my way! Johnny first, then all the women and children! Because of his heroic efforts, he is granted a passing grade and successfully graduates the fourth grade. I award you, Johnny Bravo, with your fourth grade diploma. My standards for Johnny are pretty low, so you know what? I see this as an accomplishment. Next up is the man with the golden gut. While watching TV, Johnny sees an ad for the Abdominizer 900, a machine made to sculpt the person's body into god-like form. It'll give you abs harder than the densest neutron star. Transfixed by the ad, Johnny hurriedly places his order. When the machine arrives, Johnny sets off to build it and manages to create a machine that resembles a medieval torture device instead. Yes, these are extras. He gets to work on getting the abs of his dreams and decides to hit the beach after a long day of exercise, if 
that's even what you can call it. When he arrives, he's swarmed by hordes of people who gawk at him openly. Johnny embraces the new attention to him and his sculpted abs, but as Pops passes by, he catches sight of Johnny and quickly shoos the crowd away. Johnny begins to protest, but Pops reveals that Johnny has an exact replica of Mount Rushmore embossed on his stomach, likely from the rope burn from the Abdominizer 900. <laughs> Getting huge! Whoa, I'm feeling the burn! Like the good businessman he is, Pops immediately begins to brainstorm how he can make a profit from Johnny's bodily abnormality, and soon, they both decide to pursue the financial endeavor further. What's in it for me? You can watch me make a fortune off this! I'm in! Pops presents Johnny as a freak of nature as giant crowds gather to catch a glimpse of his patriotic stomach. Johnny's baby blankets, $25! Johnny, of course, thrives with his newfound attention and fame. And just after the first week, they see an insane amount of profit. Johnny indulges in his fortune and continuously eats junk food to celebrate. Pops warns Johnny to lay off of the snacks, warning him that he might ruin his perfectly freakish body, but Johnny brushes him off. I'm done training. It makes me all sweaty like. When they return to presenting Johnny, he undresses and reveals a giant beer gut, consequently losing his Mount Rushmore abs. The crowds angrily dissipate and Johnny breaks down. What? You mean, no more fake friends? No more screaming girls? Pops informs him that if he wants the fame and fortune back, he must get back into shape. And Johnny eagerly agrees and gets to work. Oh. 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 After some hardcore exercising, Johnny manages to shed some pounds and returns back to his original weight. Where we are awaiting the return of Rushmo the Magnificent and his eerily accentuated abdominal muscles. Him and Pops return back to the stage with a bigger crowd than ever, promising the comeback of the century. However, when Johnny reveals his stomach to the crowd, it's just a tangled blob of mush that neither resembles abs nor Mount Rushmore, and Pops finally breaks down accepting the permanent loss of their fame and fortune. What a weird episode. Next is Spaffoon Lagoon. While at the beach, Johnny spots a beautiful woman wakeboarding on the water. Excuse me, can I borrow this? This indignity will be avenged. He chases after her and causes both of them to spin out of control and land on a stranded island. The woman's knowledge of survival skills greatly contrasts to Johnny's lack of intelligence, and it causes tension pretty quickly. Daydreaming about me! In order for her to buy some time away from Johnny, she orders him to search the island for some food for them. On his own, Johnny accidentally walks straight into a puddle of quicksand and has to call out for help. The woman, who has already successfully built a communication radar device, has to abandon her efforts to get help in order to go save Johnny, which she is not happy about. You saved my life! That means you dig me! Ah. Oh! When they return to shore together, Johnny has the brilliant idea to make a fire, and he takes the wood from the woman's machine, effectively destroying it and all hopes of getting help through the airwaves. In a fit of anger, the woman picks up Johnny and tosses him into the ocean. Where's a 15-foot tiger shark when you need one? Suddenly, a plane is seen flying overhead, and the woman frantically begins making a giant fire to alert the pilot's attention. She begins shouting out to the sky, and Johnny mistakenly believes that she's crying out to him to come back to her. I can't survive without you! I knew she'd come around. He zooms back to shore and shakes the water off of himself like a dog, which quickly dissipates the large flames that were growing. Finally reaching her breaking point, the woman demands Johnny to stay on one side of the island while she stays on the other, but she quickly realizes that he's not getting the hint when he continues to try and follow her. She tries to hide in secluded caves, trees, and even an active volcano, but Johnny still finds a way to be one step ahead of her. These noxious fumes should keep him away. Noxious view. Realizing she'll never be able to escape Johnny's treacherous presence, she decides the best way out of the situation is to swim out to sea. She leaps in the ocean and quickly paddles away. Just as Johnny is about to hop in the sea himself, Bunny Bravo appears in a giant submarine. She scolds Johnny for not leaving a note telling her where he is, and he apologizes. 
He hops on the submarine and informs his mother they have to catch his date, who's swimming away. They rev up the engine and continue pursuing the poor woman who's trying so desperately to escape Johnny. You know what? Johnny is nothing if not perseverant, and I can respect that. I bet you'll never guess what happens in Johnny Goes to Camp. As Johnny waits for the bus that's taking him to karate camp, he gets distracted by a woman and tries to impress her with his karate skills. Remember, one with a universe, one with a- Whoa! He ends up falling headfirst into a trash can right as his bus arrives and leaves. When he gets himself out, he spots a bus and races into it without a second glance. He soon realizes he got on the wrong bus headed to Camp Gigabyte, a computer camp for nerds. When he arrives 14 hours later, he is greeted by his camp counselor, Carl. Carl! Come back on the bus! Come back on the bus! Who is so excited to see him? The feeling is obviously not mutual, and Johnny tries to catch the bus, but fails. Carl informs him that that was the last bus until next week, and the wilderness is full of dangerous animals. So Johnny must stay at Camp Gigabyte until the following week. Later that night, Johnny tries to assert dominance over his fellow cabin mates, but quickly realizes his wimpiness as the night progresses, and he hears strange animal noises outside. The following day, Johnny tries to make the most of the situation by at least having a little fun. <laughs> He tries to take a swim in the water surrounding the camp, but quickly realizes that the lake is full of unpleasant, biting creatures like leeches, alligators, and snakes. Later that evening, the group gathers around the campfire to tell scary stories. Johnny tries his best to spook the others, but nothing he says seems to affect them. Carl tells the eerie story of a guy who experiences technical difficulties on his computer, which effectively scares all of the campers. Well, his hard drive had been completely erased. Including Johnny, who has no idea what's going on. Later in the trip, Carl leads the troop around to explore the wilderness. What do we want? Software! Where do we get it? Trading Post! He accidentally gets too close to a poisonous flower and gets completely covered in its pollen, which paralyzes him. Better stay back. They say its pollen can paralyze a man instantaneously. <laughs> The kids look to Johnny for guidance, and he attempts to lead them to civilization to no avail. The kids come up with the genius idea to charge Johnny full of static electricity and then toss him in the water, which should cause his body to point to True North. They charge him up and toss him in, and their plan works. However, Johnny soon gets swept away by the current, plummets down a steep waterfall. Finally, the week ends, and they all load up on the bus to go home, including Johnny, who is covered in casts and is on crutches. He settles in to relax on the 14-hour drive back, and the rest of the group serenades him with a song about computer parts, which is obviously greatly appreciated. In a cake too far, Bunny Bravo and Little Susie prepare to enter a bake-off the following day. They strategically maneuver and plan their recipe and routine down to the last second. But of course, Johnny gets in the way and causes them to get distracted. He proposes a quick break to throw a football, and the girls agree. While throwing the ball to Johnny, Bunny accidentally hurts her shoulder. It's a bomb, baby! And they determine that Johnny must take her place in the Bake Off team. She urges him to do a good job and win so that her recipe and picture can be published in a popular cookbook. They try to practice the recipe with little Susie and Johnny, but Johnny just makes a giant mess instead of being helpful. Hit it! Susie instructs him to leave the heavy-duty work to her and to just read the recipe off the card at the bake-off. The following day, they arrive and begin to prepare their station. Susie repeatedly checks to see if Johnny has the recipe card, and he continuously confirms that the card is in his hands. He suddenly gets distracted by a pretty lady at the neighboring station, and he tries to pull a few moves on her. Freeze heat your oven to 350 degrees, baby. <laughs> He takes the recipe card and writes his number down and gives it to the lady, just as he's pulled away by little Susie. A competition begins, and Johnny realizes that he's misplaced the card, so he proposes the idea of making a new recipe from whatever ingredients they have. They whip together a dish that they call Mama Bravo's Bubblegum, Pine Nut Beef Jerky Jamboree, which 
places in 16th place out of the 12 entries. Although they didn't win, Bunny still congratulates them. A woman approaches Bunny and insists that the new recipe is exactly what her publishing company is looking for, and the abomination secures a spot in a book titled Mama Bravo's Book of Gourmet Doorstops. In Goodnight Johnny, Johnny tries a new approach with dating, looking for lady frogs to kiss in hopes of one of them turning into a princess. Yep, he's that desperate. I can't be seen without my glasses! Especially not in front of all these chicks. After he smooches one, he sees a beautiful princess walking quickly, and decides to chase after her. Hey, froggy mama. <laughs> Let's go back to my place. I'll whip you up a nice bowl of flies. He tries to get her attention, but she smacks him in the head with a medieval weapon. He continues to follow her until they reach a renaissance carnival. What's going on here? Some kind of hippie flea market? Where Johnny believes he was transported back in time. I must have followed that frog chick back through one of the magic time portals. He looks around and stumbles upon a man and a woman dressed up as the king and queen. He hatches the brilliant plan to trick all of the people into crowning him their king, and he quickly presents himself before the royal majesties to display his superior intellect and wisdom. I am a powerful and really scary wizard! He attempts to enchant them with the power of a ballpoint pen and a string, but fails to woo them with his futuristic displays. Pen! Worship me. Worship me! They kick him out, and he storms away. He sees the princess he spotted from earlier frantically running away from an ominous black knight. Johnny leaps into action to save her, and causes the knight to be thrown off of his horse. He returns to the princess to get some praise, but she angrily shouts that he ruined the bit, and then storms away. The knight approaches him, and challenges him to a joust in front of all the people. And Johnny accepts. Uh -oh. When the joust commences, Johnny is quickly thrown off of his makeshift horse, and he lands in a garbage can, where he begins to beg the knight for mercy. The knight reveals himself to be Carl, who excitedly states that this is the best renaissance festival he's ever been to. Johnny realizes he's not actually in the Middle Ages, and begins to insult everyone there, calling them losers and jobless. Middle Ages? Ha ha ha! You're funny! <laughs> He's taken away by guards who tie him up and dump a mysterious liquid on him, Renaissance torture style. I feel like that consequence is a little extreme, but hey, you know, to each his own. Next up is As I Lay Hiccuping. Johnny inhales an entire box of cereal way too fast and comes down with a serious case of the hiccups. Eat like a human being! Bunny tries a few at-home remedies, but after his hiccups continue to worsen, she sends Johnny to the doctor. Johnny is elated to see a gorgeous woman who turns out to be his doctor. She reveals that hiccups tend to go away on their own, but to come back later in the day if they persist. The gerbil controls the left side of my body, and the monkey handles my people skill. Johnny excitedly looks forward to their date later as he leaves. How much style of acupuncture I use? One big one! <laughs> On his way home, he doesn't notice little Susie hiding in a bush, and she leaps out with an air horn and startles Johnny senseless. He realizes that the intense fear he felt scared his hiccups away. However, instead of thanking Susie, he becomes upset because he has no reason to return to the doctor's office, and he sets off to find a way to get his hiccups back. He goes to Pop's diner, where he vigorously shovels food into his mouth until he regains his hiccups. Pops approaches him and electrocutes him, revealing this method to be his go-to for getting rid of hiccups. However, when Johnny's hiccups persist, Pops remembers electrocution was actually the method for something else, and that the true cure for hiccups is a flick on the nose. I whipped up this nifty little dental device! <laughs> he sets off to find another way to get his hiccups back when he runs into Carl, who has a basket full of groceries. Johnny begins stuffing his face with contents from a random box in Carl's cart, and he soon realizes he's eating slug kibble. He begins to frantically spit it out, when all of a sudden, his hiccups return. Carl tries to tell Johnny of a foolproof cure for hiccups, but Johnny stuffs Carl in his grocery cart and sends him flying down the sidewalk. Johnny excitedly returns to the doctor's office and reunites with the beautiful doctor, who actually reveals himself to be a gruff older man. Johnny screams in fright, and the male doctor states that his hiccups should be gone for good. Hey baby, why don't you lose old Dr. Fathead and go out with me Saturday night? If a man voluntarily tries to get hiccups to see a woman, you know he's down bad. 
No wonder people are losing faith in our health care system. Starting off season three strong is Luke Perry's Guide to Love. Luke Perry, who is a real-life actor, tries to make a quick escape from a venue, but is soon pursued by a giant mob of crazy fangirls. I want to cut off a lock of his hair and clone an army of Luke Perry's. Thinking the ladies are screaming for him, Johnny Bravo welcomes them with open arms, but they quickly lose interest and run away from him. Thanks, dude. You really got me out of a tight spot. <gasps> You're Fidel Castro! Luke Perry thanks Johnny for saving him, and Johnny begs Luke for help with the ladies. Feeling obliged to help the man that just saved his life, Luke Perry agrees to walk Johnny through one date. They go to the park where Luke instructs Johnny to show him how he normally picks up chicks. And Johnny, you can just call me Luke. Okay, Luke Perry. Johnny approaches a woman on a bench, while Luke hides behind a tree and observes. Initially, Johnny begins speaking to the woman, but he cracks under the pressure of Luke Perry watching his every move and accidentally reveals Luke's location, causing them both to have to make a quick escape. They decide to change their approach. Luke Perry disguises himself as a hot dog vendor so he can observe Johnny and feed him what he needs to say through an earpiece that Johnny wears. Johnny approaches a new woman, this time solely repeating only the words that Luke says to him. Unlike anything we've seen before, this time the woman actually reciprocates Johnny's feelings and agrees to go on a date with him, and they agree to meet up later that night. Thanks, Luke Perry. They meet up, and Luke continues to tell Johnny what to say as he's disguised and sits at another table, this time using a microphone that looks like a fork to draw the least amount of attention possible. Their date continues going very well. So well, in fact, that Luke Perry decides that his work is complete and leaves it up to Johnny to finish the date successfully. Johnny loudly thanks him from across the restaurant and blows his cover. Thanks, Luke Perry. You're a great friend, Luke Perry. Johnny, no! Luke darts out of the restaurant, but is tripped on his way out by the horde of girls. As he falls, the microphone fork flings out of his hands and lands in the middle of a very intense yoga lesson across the street. When Johnny's date asks him to tell her the words she wants to hear, Johnny jumps on top of the table and begins to mimic intense yoga poses and strange sounds, and his date storms off angrily, thinking that he's just making fun of her. <sighs> Johnny, you almost had this one. Next is In the Line of Johnny. Johnny recounts the exciting events of a TV show he watched during the previous night to his karate teacher, Master Hama. Not my sacred ancestral Hummer figures! <laughs> However, in all of the excitement of recreating the events of the show, Johnny accidentally injures Master Hama, who mentions he was supposed to be the bodyguard at the Soy Harvest Parade that afternoon. Johnny eagerly begs Master Hama to let him be the bodyguard in his place, and though he was initially apprehensive at the idea, Master Hama dejectedly agrees. Here's a move I learned on Lady the Kickboxing Collie. Johnny arrives at the trailer of the Soy Queen, where he vows to keep her safe. He throws her makeup artist out of the trailer for not knowing the non-existent password. Then why didn't she tell me that she knew that I knew that? Are you here to unclog the toilet? And when the Soy Queen attempts to finish her makeup herself, Johnny snatches her lipstick out of her hands and begins to eat it to make sure it isn't poisoned. I know you're scared, baby, but your body is in good hands with Johnny. <laughs> the Soy Queen begins to leave her trailer to join the parade and demands Johnny not to follow her so he doesn't mess anything up. Meanwhile, at the parade, Carl and a team of others begin to inflate a giant parade balloon. The parade begins, and Johnny works diligently to keep a close eye on the Soy Queen's float. Pop a bear to French hen. The perimeter is secure. Repeat, the perimeter is secure. He notices a child with a lunchbox and demands to thoroughly inspect its contents. He eats the entire lunch to determine the absence of any explosives and then continues on with the parade. Why, these plastic explosives are delicious! He notices the giant parade balloon and determines that it's actually an evil alien who wants to do harm to the Soy Queen, and he springs into action. He's losing it, folks. He leaps onto the Soy Queen's float and brings her below to the driver's side. He shoves the driver out of the way and hits the pedal to the metal. Jackal to Red Snapper, abort mission. Repeat, abort mission. Unaware that the balloon had gotten tangled to the float and was now stuck to it, Johnny manages to break the float free from the balloon, but accidentally drives him and the Soy Queen into a soybean warehouse. 
An angry soybean farmer berates them for ruining his crop, and he angrily throws a handful of soybeans at them. Johnny, still fully committed to protecting the queen, throws himself in front of her, successfully blocking any harm that would have come from the beans. He slyly asks for a reward for saving her, and she proceeds to smack him on his head repeatedly with her scepter. In The Incredible Shrinking Johnny, Bunny sends Johnny to the store to pick up some foot powder. Network swimsuit models. Sure hope I don't hit traffic. Upon arriving at the store, Johnny determines that the building with produce and shopping carts out front seems too obvious, and decides the shady building next door must be the correct store. He peruses the aisles and notices the strange selection that includes salamander tongues, spider eggs, and even some shrunken heads. He finds a mysterious powder and determines that that is good enough to bring back home to his mother. When he goes to the front of the store to pay, he is met with a mysterious and beautiful woman. Johnny grabs her hand and kisses it. I know what you're thinking, and the answer is yes, I am available. And she angrily warns him not to touch her again, or else he'll face dire consequences. Johnny, of course, takes this as an invitation to try even harder, and he sweeps her off of her feet. In a fit of rage, she begins uttering strange words, zaps Johnny with a cloud of energy, and throws him out of the store. Any chance you got a hot tub out back? Oh! As he gets on his motor scooter to leave, Johnny notices that it feels a little bigger than usual. On his way home, Johnny is pulled over by a police officer who asks him why he's not in school. Okay, pull over, kid. Johnny realizes that he's shrinking, and soon he's so tiny that he's able to sneak past the police officer without any repercussions. No, I ain't going! Help! Help! Anybody other than the police! He runs to find help, and ends up bumping into little Susie. Instead of helping him return back to his normal size, Susie takes him home and forces him to be one of her dolls. When Johnny tries to fight one of her stuffed animals, Susie puts him in timeout, where he tries to escape to find help. Yeah, well, they're creeping me out with their dead eyes, like a like a doll's eyes. He flings himself out of the window and lands across the street in Carl's room. Good thing the window's open. Carl begins using his microscope to check on a science experiment he's doing, and he spots Johnny, who begs for his help. Suddenly, an amoeba under the microscope begins attacking Johnny and trying to absorb him. Carl runs to get his molecular re-enlargener from the other room, while Johnny fights for his dear life. He returns and zaps Johnny in hopes of returning him back to normal. As little Susie takes a stroll, she runs into Johnny, who has returned to full size again. However, Johnny and Carl run right past her, and chasing them is a giant amoeba that Carl accidentally zapped and made life-size. Next is Backdaft. At a city hall meeting, Carl and Pops beg for volunteers for the fire brigade. This stinks. When does the movie start? There's no movie, Johnny. When they display a poster of a fireman surrounded by hot chicks, Johnny's interest is immediately piqued. He excitedly volunteers himself to join the brigade. I'd be a great fireman. I've got the suspenders already. Anyway, I love fire. I could watch it burn for hours. And after no one else shows interest, Pops is forced to allow Johnny to join, though he seemed rather unhappy about it. The following morning, Johnny arrives at the firehouse for his training. While they wait for Pops to arrive, Carl takes it in his own hands to read Johnny a poem he wrote about the responsibilities of the fireman. While Carl drones on and on, Johnny takes a look around, repeatedly sliding down the fireman's pole and then accidentally breaking a hole in the wall with the fireman ladder. He did it! Pops arrives and begins Johnny's training. First, Pops has Carl sit in a tree and pretend to be a stuck cat, and assigns Johnny with the task of getting him down. Johnny takes the only logical approach and aggressively chops the tree down, which lands on top of Carl. Pops, I'm frightened. I know, son. They decide to move on to the next part of training, where Carl stands in a fake burning building. Johnny is given the fire hose and instructed to successfully put out the fire within an allotted time frame. Johnny hands the hose to Carl briefly, and when the water starts to surge out, Carl is whipped around by the powerful hose. Pops decides it's time for a lunch break, so he and Johnny return to the firehouse. They eat expensive food and watch midday television, and Pops informs him that eating and drinking on the public's tab is the most important part of the job. Sitting around eating and drinking on the public tab, part of being a fireman too? If you learn only that during your training, then I've done my job. Suddenly, the fire alarm rings, and Carl springs into action. I don't know, the dang thing's always going off during my program. Informing the other two that a real fire has broken out. Johnny and him argue about who gets to drive the truck, and after a very fair game, wink wink, of rock, paper, scissors, Johnny tears out of the firehouse at full speed. 
You think he'll come back for us? Completely leaving Carl and Pops. He arrives at that devastating scene to find a woman who has slightly burnt her popcorn. After using an axe to break through the walls of her home, he insists that everything will be taken care of. Right before he loses control of the fire hose again and completely floods the room. He instructs her to follow him out of the fire escape and leaps out the window before the woman can inform him that she doesn't have a fire escape. As he lays on the ground below, Pops catches up to him and suggests he takes a 20 year unpaid vacation from the fire brigade, which is probably for the best. In Jurassic Dork, Johnny excitedly heads to the hobby shop to pick up a new model toy. He comes across a museum and determines that it must be the hobby shop that he's looking for. He explores the inside and enters the dinosaur exhibit. I can't believe they used to make planes like this. He notices that whoever built the models did a poor job, so he takes upon himself to fix them. He yanks a dinosaur skeleton head off and accidentally knocks all the other skeletons over. Security yells at him to stop, but he grabs a dinosaur egg thinking it's the model toy he was looking for, and he runs out before he can be caught. Uh-oh, hobby shop guy, now I'm in trouble. When he returns home, the egg hatches, and Johnny is overjoyed with his new pet that he thinks is a hamster. Astounding! This model kit comes with a free baby hamster! He quickly has his hands full with his adorable prehistoric friend and fully embraces fatherhood with open arms. A stick! Fetch! <laughs> He thinks he's a dog. A few weeks go by and Johnny and his very large pet, Mr. Wuggles, visit a grocery store to get him some more hamster food. Johnny feeds him some lettuce, but Mr. Wuggles begins to show more interest in a carnivorous diet. <laughs> more time passes and Carl decides to pay Johnny a visit. When he opens the front door, he's greeted by a fully grown Mr. Wuggles. <laughs> and he becomes starstruck from being in the presence of a real-life humongosaurus rex, which Johnny still insists is a hamster. Carl runs to get his camera so he can document such a monumental occasion, and Mr. Wuggles takes this as a signal to break through the walls of the house and escape. Heal! Heal, Mr. Wuggles! Mr. Wuggles' large frame causes him to wreak destruction on Aaron City, and he's soon surrounded by the military, ready to take him down with their tanks. Wait, Susan! That's General! Right, what did I say? Johnny pleads with the General to let him try to calm down Mr. Wuggles, and the General accepts. Arm the missile. Johnny begins to sing a heartfelt song and successfully calms Mr. Wuggles down, and the pair decides to celebrate with a couple of root beers. Yeah! I too also struggle to tell my pet hamster and my giant pet dinosaur apart, so I get it. In a walk on the stupid side, little Susie asks Johnny if he'd participate in the annual walk against baldness. Initially, he declines, but upon learning that the race is organized by a group of concerned, shapely supermodels, he quickly changes his mind. Oh, Johnny, you have such strong calf muscles. Susie volunteers to be his first sponsor, pledging to donate a penny for every mile that he completes. Let's see, walk in the hot sun for a bunch of bald guys for no good reason? Johnny arrives at the event to sign up, where he meets an attractive volunteer. He flirts with her and proposes that they go on a date after he finishes the walkathon, which she rushes off. I'm very anxious to walk against the bald. For too long, they've infiltrated our schools. She provides him with a map of the race, and he suggests that if she wants to see him sooner, she should tell him a shortcut. She tells him a completely different route from the other walkers, and even after Johnny receives a straight punch to the face, he still believes that by following the new path, he'll be scoring a date. The event begins, and Johnny promptly takes a sharp turn away from all the other walkers. Bye. Back at the Bravo residence, little Susie is joined by Johnny's other sponsors, Carl and Bunny. They turn on the TV and see that Johnny has already walked 3,100 miles off course. I think it's safe to say that the only people stupider than this guy are the people who sponsored him. They begin to panic when they realize that if Johnny continues at the pace he's going, they'll collectively owe over $3.6 billion to the charity. That's more than $3.5 billion! They begin planning on how to stop Johnny and split up. 
Johnny makes it to the middle of the Pacific Ocean when he's approached by Carl, who tries to get Johnny to turn around. After Johnny refuses, Carl tries to pop the floating devices he's standing on, but he accidentally causes Johnny to be propelled forward instead. He contacts Bunny, who tells him to return back home. Johnny continues into China, where he runs into his mother. Those bald people build a 1,000 mile wall to keep me from finishing! Who feeds him loads of food in an effort to slow him down and make him tired. Instead, the food energizes him and he continues on. Bunny realizes that she accidentally put coffee beans inside of the burritos she fed him instead of regular beans, and realizes that's why her plan failed. Target is now entering African continent! You've got to stop him, Susie! Johnny makes it all the way to Africa where little Susie has gathered a wall of elephants to block his path and stop him. A herd of giant leather-skinned bald men! Johnny decides that he must wrestle them, and goes to change his socks to improve his traction. However, when he takes his shoes off, the stench of his sweaty feet causes the elephants to retreat. Ah, pick me! <laughs> Susie, Bunny, and Carl wait at the finish line for Johnny to return and they bitterly accept their defeat and inevitable bankruptcy. Johnny comes barreling towards the finish line, then suddenly collapses from exhaustion just before he reaches it. Because he never crossed it, his sponsors don't have to pay, and they happily take him home to tuck him into bed. Gentlemen, our worldwide conspiracy continues. In Chain Gang Johnny, Johnny and Carl get thrown out of a movie theater after Johnny read the subtitles out loud in silly voices and made shadow puppets during the movie. It was rich in symbolism. It was rich in boring me to death. They begin arguing and causing a scene, which catches the attention of two nearby police officers. One remembers that they're supposed to be looking for two perpetrators of a crime, and seeing Johnny and Carl are two people, they determine that they must be the two criminals that they're searching for. They promptly arrest them and have them sent to Stinking Bog Correctional Facility. It was Carl! He's an international cattle rustler, and he doesn't recycle! Johnny tries to woo the female warden unsuccessfully, and he's punished by being issued solitary confinement in the box. Hey, warden mama. Ha! The name's 864129, but you can call me. Hey. Carl begs the warden not to punish Johnny, and as a result, he is also issued time in the box with Johnny. I get dibs on the breathing hole. Not the box! Sweet merciful! The two are kept in the box for 17 days straight. When the warden goes to get them, she opens the box to find a horde of party guests leaving, and Carl explaining all of the tasteful renovations that he and Johnny did while they were inside. Seeing them thrive during their punishment angers the warden, so she assigns them to break down rocks, glue them back together, and then destroy them again. That's it! I can't take it anymore! Johnny begins to hit his breaking point, but Carl reveals his master plan for their escape. Later that night, Johnny and Carl, dressed as a loving couple, thank the warden for watching after the convicts and announce their departure. Feel free to eat anything in the refrigerator. The warden happily opens the door for them and they leave, and they celebrate their easy escape. Suddenly, the warden remembers that she isn't a babysitter and that Carl and Johnny escape. They sound the alarms and begin to pursue the escaped convicts. Carl and Johnny hide in the disgusting bog as a group of officers with search dogs pass by. They almost get away until Johnny realizes he's covered in leeches and lets out a huge scream, alerting the warden and the officers. They continue to run away and they jump off a cliff in hopes of being able to float safely to shore. By clinging to these coconuts, we can ride every seventh wave out to sea. It'll be fine, you go first. <laughs> they wash up on a beach and are spotted by the same officers that arrested them previously, who take them back to the correctional facility. Here is a failure! No! No! no. Next is Altur Altur, French title, how classy. After a mistake with the mail, Johnny accidentally receives a $7 million grant for an art film. Mama, mama, the $7 million grant check for my art film arrived. He decides that even though he isn't a director, nor has any directing experience, he will use the money to make a film like it was intended to be used. Johnny brings along Carl and Pops to help his movie dreams come to life. Your experience as a fry cook should make you an excellent choice for cinematographer. He holds auditions for the leading lady, but every woman who tries out is so repulsed by Johnny and his advances, he's left with no one to play the part. Now quick, kiss me, kiss me hard. What? I don't see that in the script. Suddenly, a famous Italian movie star arrives to audition for the role. Instead of being put off by Johnny's behavior, she explains that most brilliant directors are pigs, so Johnny must be amazing, and she agrees to be a part of the movie. 
Mamma mia, that's a spicy meatball. Right before they begin filming, Johnny fires all of the crew because one of them asked a question. So are there any questions? You're fired! He announces that he will now be both the director and the entirety of the crew. They begin filming a scene where a group of astronauts go into space, and they accidentally send the actors into outer space with a real rocket. Action! Like a true businessman, Johnny doesn't let this setback get to him, and he decides that he will also be playing all of the other roles as well to compensate for their severe lack of actors. Camera! When Johnny ruins one of the giant inflatable props, the Italian actress realizes that he's actually a giant moron and she quits on the spot. Determined as ever, Johnny continues working on the film all by himself. Later, he admires his masterpiece alone on a giant projector screen, satisfied with his life's work. Don't you just hate when your government grants of $7 million gets lost in the mail? I swear it happens to me like twice a week. It's ridiculous. In a reject runs through it, Johnny visits Pop's diner. Congratulate me. My cholesterol level is up to 405. Where he learns of Pop's new business venture of selling live bait to fishermen. When he notices how many chicks the fishermen seem to get, he decides he too wants to become a renowned fisherman. Hey, baby. I once kept a goldfish in my mouth for an entire month. Pops proposes that they all fly to Alaska so that Johnny can catch the last living sassy mouth salmon, and they agree. On the flight there, Carl begins to annoy Johnny and they get into a fight, which causes Pops to crash the plane. Pull up, Pops! Pull up! Luckily, no one is injured, and Johnny sets off to track down the famous sassy mouth salmon. When he casts his reel, he accidentally hooks his own pants and causes himself to fall into the water. A fish appears and begins to make fun of him. Due to his <clears throat> sassy demeanor, Johnny determines that this fish is none other than the sassy mouth salmon that he's hunting for. The salmon taunts Johnny and swims away. After I catch you and eat you, I am going to wash your mouth out like soap. Johnny decides to change his approach by using a fancier lure to entice the salmon. <laughs> hey! Honest Abe! When he casts his line again, the salmon catches it and hooks it onto an underwater bomb from World War II. He tells Johnny to reel in his line, assuring him that he successfully hooked him. Johnny excitedly brings his line in and sets off the bomb, which explodes in his face. The salmon laughs at him and swims away, but this time, Johnny angrily follows, determined to catch the fish that continuously makes a mockery of him. He notices the salmon trying to impress the female salmon, but failing miserably. After seeing the salmon get rejected multiple times, Johnny offers him some advice, because who better knows how to impress the ladies than Johnny Bravo? He advises him to be himself, and if all else fails, to flash his pecs. The sassy mouth salmon approaches a new lady and flashes his fishy pecs, instantly winning over her affection. See those moves? I told him that. Pops and Carl find Johnny and urge him to capture the salmon since he has him within his grasp. However, Johnny becomes protective over the salmon and insists no one will capture or eat him if he has anything to do with it. Instead, Pops takes the salmon and his lady back to the diner where they employ him as a new cook. Pops, this salmon is delicious. What did you do to it? That's trout almondine, you nabob. The fact that they force the salmon to cook and serve other fish is kind of morbid, though. We're commencing the fourth and final season with Johnny Bravo Goes to Hollywood. After Johnny is kicked out of a movie theater, seriously, what is with this guy and being disruptive at the movies? He's approached by a big time movie producer who promises to make him a star. You got that look that appeals to the 18 to 34 year old demographic. He hands him a bus ticket to Hollywood and a map to the movie studio and instructs Johnny to meet him there. A movie star. The locals of Air and City gather to throw Johnny a going away party, which may or may not actually be a celebration of him leaving the town. Goodbye, Mama. He hops on the bus and heads towards his future of fame and fortune. When he arrives at the studio, he's greeted by famous celebs Jessica Bale, Alec Baldwin, and a random hobbit who sing him a welcome song. 
I'm really looking to play against type as the wacky neighbor. As he prepares to head to set for first day of filming, he's informed by a studio worker that he's been replaced by a CGI version of Mark Hamill. First things first. You're fired! What? Devastated by this news, Johnny determines that he must find the producer who scouted him and have him remedy the situation. Johnny ventures all over the studio, causing trouble and crashing sets, causing him to be chased by a mob of security guards. He finally manages to find the producer, who tells him that he's yesterday's news. Kid, you're gonna be the next big star! After Johnny gets caught and thrown out of the studio, he decides to make it big on his own by auditioning for talent agencies. Next! Oh, that would be me. Unfortunately, he soon finds out that in order to be a part of a talent agency, you have to have talent. <laughs> Just as all hope is lost, Johnny begins to hear a voice from the sky that tells him to go where the love is. He realizes that his true place is in Aaron City, not Hollywood. In the world of Hollywood, there's an ancient saying. I pity the fool. And he hops on the bus back home. When he arrives, a giant welcome home party greets him and he begins to tear up. Some talking sky man once told me that you gotta go where the love is. However, the crowd of people reveal that the party is actually for the bus driver who drove Johnny back. He returns to his home and turns on the TV, where a compilation of all the chaos he caused at the movie studio is broadcast for all the world to see. Although it wasn't a big time movie, Johnny still is satisfied with his brief 15 minutes of fame. We have exclusive footage of the desperate, pathetic act. In Home Alone, Bunny Bravo nervously prepares to leave Johnny alone for a week while she goes on a vacation. Johnny insists he's a big boy now and that he can manage staying home alone. I haven't had an accident in three days. After he sees his mom off, he tries to go back inside the house, but realizes he's locked himself out. If you forget how to breathe, it's inhale, then exhale. So he crawls through the chimney to get back inside. Little Susie enters his house and reveals that Bunny had left her a key so she could check on Johnny from time to time. Johnny insists that he doesn't need any help and shoes her out of the house. He sits on the sofa and determines that if he doesn't move for the entire week his mother is gone, nothing can go wrong. He quickly is distracted by a television ad about food and decides to go to the kitchen and make a smoothie with every food item in the pantry. He mashes all the buttons together on the blender and ends up pressing the tornado button. Johnny Bravo 1, Mr. Blender Man 0. Which creates a giant food whirlwind in the kitchen. Little Susie flies by in the food storm and offers her help, but Johnny stubbornly rejects it and she floats away. Johnny's mother calls him and he insists that everything is going just fine. The following day, Johnny plants himself back on the couch, even more determined to not move until his mother returns. Nothing will go wrong after. Oh! Oh! Suddenly, a wrecking ball smashes through the side of his house. A frazzled construction worker apologizes for hitting the wrong house and leaves quickly. Another man approaches Johnny and prompts him to sign a delivery paper. When Johnny asks what the delivery is, a giant truck shows up and dumps a sea of mud into his house. A pig walking through the neighborhood notices this and begins bathing in the mud happily. Susie shows up with a bucket and a mop, but again, Johnny refuses her help and decides to clean it up all by himself. He goes to fill the bucket up with water, but is distracted by an incoming call. You've reached the Bravos, home of the one and only Johnny Bravo. He answers the phone and goes back and forth with the other caller, who realizes he's called the wrong number. The house becomes flooded with water since Johnny had left the faucet on when he went to fill up the bucket. Something smells fishy. You got that right. Susie paddles over on a boat and yet again offers to help Johnny, who refuses again. He opens up a window to drain the house and ends up being swept away along with the water. Later that night, as he's watching the news, Johnny learns of a criminal mastermind on the loose who's stealing people's clothes. Until he's wearing your pants. My pants? Your pants, Johnny. And frantically boards up his closet in hampers. No one's taking the Bravo family duds tonight. <laughs>
He is startled by Susie, who had come over to tuck Johnny into bed and to read him a bedtime story. Johnny instructs her to leave, and when he turns around, he's faced by the clothes horse crook, who is the horse slash criminal responsible for all of the clothes robberies. Technically, I'm a pony, but let's keep that between you and me. The horse tries to steal Bunny's clothes, but Johnny gives him his clothes in exchange for the return of his mother's garments. Now that's one swanky looking stallion. The next few days, the Bravo household continues to fall more and more into disarray. On the sixth day, an insurance salesman knocks on Johnny's door and tries to sell him fairy tale insurance, which Johnny rejects. I got a fairy tale for you. Once upon a time. Get lost! After sending the salesman away, there is another knock at the door. And when Johnny answers it, he's met face to face with a beautiful little red riding hood. I thought I told you to get. Who tricks her way into his house and invites a giant horde of fairy tale creatures, who trash his house even more. Johnny gets a call from his mother, who informs him that she'll be returning home from vacation a day early. He begins to panic and finally accepts the help of little Susie. I need some. Who calls in a repair team, the three little pigs, and puts the rest of the fairy tale creatures to work cleaning the house. By the time Bunny arrives back home, the house is in tip top shape, and she congratulates Johnny on being responsible enough to be left home alone. And the walls are even more delicious. He almost gets away with everything. Until she goes into the bathroom and finds an alligator in the toilet. Yeah, I know that struggle. Those doctor visits are awkward to explain. Next is T is for trouble. When Johnny hears a knock at the door, he's surprised to see Mr. T. Does that T stand for taco? You crazy? Mr. T explains he is there in response to a letter that Johnny sent him when he was in elementary school regarding a kid named Little Ricky Simmons. Johnny has a flashback to his childhood days where he remembers being bullied by Little Ricky Simmons who would push him over so he would land flat on his back, earning him the nickname Johnny flat on your back o ah, very clever. Little Ricky Simmons, the school bully, bullies me. Mr. T apologizes for his late response, but promises to amend it by teaching Johnny how to stand up to his bully. Little Susie enters and greets Mr. T, prompting Johnny to ask if they know each other. They reveal that Mr. T had taught Susie how to stand up to bullies as well. She demonstrates her intimidating skills. <laughs> What you guys said. They try to help Johnny come up with a menacing catchphrase like, I pity the fool. Like, it's tea time, sucker. But Johnny just ends up making a bunch of weird, concerning sounds. Mr. T decides to move on and try a different approach. Johnny is presented with a toucan and instructed to tackle the tough toucan to symbolize tackling his fear. Instead of regaining power over his past, Johnny proceeds to get his butt whooped by a tropical bird. They move on with his training, where Mr. T proceeds to teach Johnny how to make a healthy snack alternative with celery, peanut butter, and raisins. Crazy fool! Never underestimate the power of healthy snack making! After their snack break, Johnny continues his training with an inspiring and motivational workout montage. Finally, Mr. T decides Johnny is ready to approach his bully. He instructs Johnny to put on a little Bo Peep dress to assert his dominance. Then why aren't you wearing one? You think I'll be caught in something like that? Johnny arrives at little Ricky Simmons' house, where he knocks on the door. When Ricky answers the door, Johnny begins making his incoherent noises at him while dressed in his girly costume. Ricky invites Johnny inside his home, where he apologizes for his behavior from when they were kids. I'm sorry. Really? He reaches out his hand, and when Johnny goes to shake it, Ricky flips him on the back again and begins taunting him. Ricky threatens him with a wet willy, and Johnny sees a vision of Mr. T, who instructs him to make a healthy snack alternative. Flat on your back, oh. Not good, oh. Johnny runs into the kitchen where he constructs the celery masterpiece he had learned previously. When Ricky tries to leap onto Johnny, he is quickly subdued when the snack is shoved into his mouth. A healthy and delicious treat causes him to call a genuine truce, and he and Johnny absolve their past conflict. 
<laughs> if only I had Mr. T to walk me through all of my life's conflicts, maybe things wouldn't be too bad. Next up is the time of my life. While little Susie and Bunny go through Johnny's old yearbook, they find a yearbook photo of a girl named Sandy Baker with hearts drawn all around it. When Susie asks about her, Johnny reveals that she was the prettiest, most popular girl in school, and how he admired her from afar. Got straight A's. I totally and once even taught a group of orphans how to ski. He has a flashback where he recalls his past scrawny self who used to get bullied by the big muscular guys in school and how Sandy stood up for Johnny one time when she saw him getting picked on. After receiving her help, she and Johnny agree to study together where Johnny then asks her to the prom. She excitedly says yes and Johnny decides to get buff before the big day. When I'm with you, when prom night finally rolls around, he shows up to Sandy's house, but after knocking on her door and never receiving an answer, he realizes he's been stood up. He sadly admits that he never saw her again after that night, and believes that Sandy ended up hiding from him. How could she say yes and then leave you hanging? When a car pulls up outside, Bunny reveals that she called Sandy and invited her over. The doorbell rings and a very flustered Johnny goes to answer it. When he opens the door, he's greeted by a very excited Sandy who cheerfully greets him. Johnny passive aggressively mentions her standing him up on prom night, which prompts confusion from Sandy. She reminds him of the night when he asked her to prom and reminds him that she mentioned that she would love to go, but couldn't because her family was moving away, which Johnny just conveniently didn't hear. Is that why you kept coming over? To say goodbye? That's right. What? You didn't tell me that. I didn't? She apologizes for the miscommunication and asks if there's anything she can do to make it up to him. Johnny proposes a date, but Sandy states that she's already married and reveals her seven children who are waiting in the car. He realizes that since he dislikes children, maybe it was for the best that they didn't end up together. Can you imagine having seven kids just like me running around the house? In Wilderness Protection Program, Johnny is approached by a cow businesswoman from the Wilderness Protection Program. Program and is assigned a domestic partner who is in hiding from the mob. Woo! Bring it on, cow woman! Johnny excitedly agrees to having a new wife and is presented with Becky, an overly affectionate moose. Becky and Johnny are expected to fulfill the roles of elephant husband and wife in order to guarantee Becky's safety. You want me to marry a lady moose? Technically, you've already married her. You may now kiss the bride. Later that night, Becky explains that while working as a waitress in a speakeasy, she accidentally interrupted one of the mob's secret meetings. After she ran away in fear for her life, she realized that she dropped her purse with her ID and full address in the room with the mob, and is now in hiding from them. Johnny agrees to pretend to be a good old-fashioned all-American elephant family to protect her, and Becky thanks him relentlessly. However, as time passes by, Johnny's flirtatious manner with other, ahem, <clears throat> human women proves to be a bit of a challenge in their partnership. You like fish sticks? I guess. So do I. It's like we're soulmates. Meanwhile, the mob boss instructs his underlings to find Becky, and they use her license to track down her address. After they are unable to find her, they realize that she must have gone undercover, and the mob boss demands they find her and give her what she deserves. Not now, baby cakes, I'm watching my stories. All right. While talking to Becky, Johnny notices a puzzle piece stuck to her fur. She begins to panic as she realizes that the piece must have accidentally gotten stuck in her fur as she was trying to escape the speakeasy. They determine that the puzzle piece is actually the missing piece to the secret mob plan that Becky overheard. The puzzle piece is green, and green people always want something from you. They brainstorm for hours until they determine that the mob has a secret plan to steal all of the honey from the bears in the forest. You know what we have to do now, right? Take off this fake beard. They rush into the forest and awaken all of the hibernating bears, where they frantically try to inform them of the mob's plan. The bears, unhappy from being woken up from their long winter's nap, don't listen to them, and instead decide to attack Johnny. Suddenly, the mob boss's underlings appear, and Becky begins to panic. <laughs> oh, please! Mr. Mob Guys, don't kill me! Johnny begs them to spare his life, and the two underlings become confused. They reveal that they aren't part of the mob, and the only reason they were tracking Becky down was to return her purse to her. They explain that they're members of the Elks Club, and that the only thing they do is solve jigsaw puzzles together. They all return back to the leader, and Becky returns the missing puzzle piece for their puzzle. This puzzle was an unsolvable mystery without it. 
I spent countless sleepless nights trying to figure it out. Okay, I've got to say it again. What is with this dude to getting set up with animal girlfriends? I mean, seriously, he attracts some wackos. Either that or the staff is into some very particular stuff. Finally, in Back on Shaq, Shaq, yeah, the real Shaquille O'Neal, continuously misses basket after basket and is stuck in a bad luck streak while playing an intense basketball game. <laughs> Meanwhile, Johnny tries to make a move on the cheerleaders on the sidelines, where he annoys them so much that one tries to shove him out of the way. Johnny goes flying and collides with Shaq right as he shoots another basket. Miraculously, this one finally makes it into the hoop, and the crowd goes wild. Shaq picks Johnny up and shoots again and again, making the basket each time. He tells Johnny that he's now his good luck charm, and whether he likes it or not, Johnny eagerly agrees when he realizes it means he gets to be in the general vicinity of the cheerleaders. You can look, but you can't touch. As long as I get to look. Johnny and Shaq begin their string of victories, constantly pummeling the opposing teams thanks to Johnny's super strong good luck energy. Shaquille O'Neal! Yay! Jack's comeback lands him a major brand deal, and he and Johnny begin to take over the cover of every single sports magazine. They enjoy their new and improved lifestyle as a pair, each one mutually benefiting from their business relationship. While in his winning streak, Shaq agrees to rematch Seth Green, who obliterated him the last time they played basketball together. Who outscored? Outplayed! Will you just announce the fool? Seth tries to intimidate Shaq, but Shaq eagerly reveals Johnny as his secret weapon. Seth cheekily displays his very own good luck charm he brought along, Huckleberry Hound. We can take them. Remember, Shaq, Eye of the Tiger. The game begins, and Seth and Shaq continue to be neck and neck, each scoring frequently due to their good luck charms. <laughs> Seth aggressively bumps into Shaq, resulting in a foul and granting Shaq a free throw. Huckleberry Hound accidentally insults the ref, resulting in another foul and an additional free throw for Shaq. As Shaq prepares to take his shot, Johnny breaks free from his harness and runs to the bathroom. Concentrate, focus, follow through. Oh, Rick! He quickly returns, but is barred from entering the court while Shaq completes his throw. Miraculously, Shaq makes both throws and wins the game. Wait! You're not supposed to be good without me! Realizing he's capable of making baskets without Johnny, Shaq ditches him and leaves with his group to celebrate his victory. So maybe we'll see you around? Yeah? Not. Seth Green and Huckleberry Hound invite him to drown his sorrows in hot cocoa, and Johnny dejectedly accepts. Not only did Johnny Bravo bring us countless hours of fun and lively characters, but the inclusion of multiple celebrity cameos and other appearances like Scooby and the gang gave the show a little extra element that is incomparable to anything else that was airing at the time. Along with its slightly elevated adult humor, Johnny Bravo still remains entertaining to people of all age demographics, something for everyone. Bravo! You made it to the end of the video. If you liked what you saw, hit that subscribe button to be the first to join us on our next cartoon endeavor. I hope you enjoyed reminiscing on this show as much as I did, and we'll see you next time. Bye!